All right. Hi, everybody. Can you all see me? Um, so welcome to our speaker series. Thanks again to Tim Haggard for supporting the speaker series. We really appreciate your support. Um, so I'm hoping tonight will be fun as we talk about fake forgery or friendly copy. Um, when I say fun, it's it's really not a whole lot of fun because <laughs> these are actually real world issues that affect museums. And I will be talking about um, examples from our museum's collection. So although my title is somewhat specific, fake forgery or friendly copy, really this talk is going to be about the larger concept of originality and authenticity. So what does it mean for an artwork to be authentic or original? As I will demonstrate, um, in some cases, the lines are actually really blurred and it's hard to really determine is something fully authentic or fully original. So instead, the way I'd like to envision it is that authenticity for artwork really runs on a spectrum. It's not necessarily an either or issue. So to be sure, we will definitely be looking at forgeries. No doubt about it, these are works that without question are forgeries. But I'm also gonna kind of lead up to it with a lot of examples that demonstrate that just because there's a duplicate artwork out there, it doesn't necessarily mean it is a forgery. And that'll become hopefully clear as, as I go through it. So one of the things I want you to think about as we're talking about authenticity is that a lot of these definitions and clarifications are going to be um, dependent upon the time period in which the artwork was created. So what were the ideals at the time? Um, were copies allowed? And what does that mean? Um, the other thing we're going to think about is the intent of the maker. So in particular, is there an intent to deceive? Is there an intent to dupe a buyer into purchasing a work thinking it's by another artist? So again, sometimes yes, for sure, 100%. Other times we don't fully know. So now that I've set the scene for some confusion, <laughs> we're going to start with some definitions. Um, so first and foremost, I want to clarify how I'm using um, these two words in my title, fake and forgery. So when I'm using the word fake, um, you're so when you learn about fakes and forgeries, you're going to see a lot of people use them interchangeably. So that's why I just want to clarify the way I'm using them for this talk. So when I'm talking about a fake artwork, I'm talking about an artwork that does has not existed before. This is a, maybe it's a newly discovered work by an artist. So a composition that's new, but done in the style of a particular artist, and most importantly, done with the intent to deceive someone in thinking it's by a particular artist. When I'm talking about a forgery, which is um, most of the examples of forgeries are from our collection that I'm going to show you, these are artworks where there is an original out there that was made by a master artist, but copies were made with the intent to deceive the buyer. So now that we have that clarification, we're going to talk about more definitions. Um, so one of the things I, I want to talk about when we get into issues of authenticity is what you might find when you visit a museum or when you look at a gallery or when you look at an auction catalog, if you're buying artwork, you're going to see different ways that artists and authorship are listed. And so I want to go through these to just kind of clarify some of the, the terms that you might see when you're visiting a museum. So I'm using a very classic example. I imagine you all recognize this painting. Um, this is the type of label you might find if you go to the Louvre, where you will approach the Mona Lisa or La Gioconda, and you will see that it says Leonardo da Vinci. So there's no qualifier there, right? It's just his name. This tells us that the Louvre is putting their stamp on this, saying that this painting is without a doubt by Leonardo da Vinci. That's not to say the attribution might change later on, but for the sake of this conversation, scholars agree, the Louvre agrees, this is by Leonardo da Vinci. So it's a little bit different when you start getting into other artworks. Um, for example, the one here on the right, this is from the UAMA collection. It is on view. So when you come and visit our museum, which I hope you all do, um, you'll see that the label doesn't say Giacomo Pontormo, it says attributed to. So what does attributed to mean? Um, and I'm comparing it with one um, uh, Pontormo that's at, in the collection of the Getty, just so you have another, another work by him that you can look at. So attributed to means that the artwork is probably by the artist. A lot of people think it's by the artist, but there's still some questions to it. So maybe there's 
a scholar who doesn't agree, you know, a foremost scholar on Pontormo who doesn't agree with this attribution. Or maybe it seems like, yes, part of it is by Pontormo, but maybe part of it also seems to be by his workshop or his assistants. Or maybe there's questions regarding previous conservation treatments that maybe some things happen in the treatment that have kind of taken away some of the signature elements of the artist and now we can't 100% make a decision about it. So there are numerous reasons why an artwork might be listed as attributed without you know, the full stake of the, the authorship being, being there on the label. You also might come to a museum like ours and see this painting on the left and you might see something written studio of, or sometimes you might see the word workshop, so workshop of. So on the left, I'm showing you a painting by the studio of Lucas Cronach, the Elder. And on the right, I'm showing you a work that is considered to be by the master artist himself. So what does it mean to have a work um, by the studio? It means quite literally that this is a master artist who held their own studio. They had a workshop. They had a lot of commissions that they had to meet, a lot of clients. And the only way that they could accomplish this is by working with a number of assistants. Um, and so this is an example where this painting is of a high enough quality that suggests it came from the workshop itself. So probably this apprentice was working under the supervision of the artist and this artist was helping, you know, meet demand. So Lucas Cronach had a big workshop. He had a lot of clients, a lot of really important clients. There's no way he could have pleased every client without running this big workshop. And so here we have an example of that. So now it starts to get a little further removed um, when you start to get into terms like follower of. So follower of means, and I'm showing you an example here, follower of means that this artist lives at the same time period as the master artist but they very clearly do not work directly with the artist. So their style is not close enough to suggest that they are employed by the artist, that they're apprentice of the artist, or even a student of the artist at one point in their career. But it's somebody who maybe, you know, lives in the area of Mantania, maybe has visited churches, has seen his work, um, really likes it and wants to emulate that style. But it doesn't suggest a strong relationship between the artist. You also might see distinctions that say after a particular artist. So here I'm showing you a print um, on the right from the UAMA collection. Um, this is a print that is based on a painting and the inscription, the inscription down below uh, credits that painting. Um, and this is quite common with a lot of prints that you know there were particular paintings that became very popular. Um, people were interested in the compositions. Obviously the artist couldn't reproduce the painting on their own or perhaps there was a printmaker who wanted to document this very famous painting. And then you could reproduce these prints and spread them around. Um, so this implies that it is after um, a composition that already exists. That can also happen with paintings. And I will show you some examples. So already, I, I hope I'm kind of setting the stage that there are many sort of definitions of authorship. And again, this idea of originality and authenticity is a bit more fluid than just, yes, it's by an artist who's called this name, or no, it's not by that artist. Sometimes it's really kind of a gray area. So I'm going to hone in on a few examples um, that are could be duplicates, copies, variants, but are not necessarily referred to in the scholarship or widely thought of as outright forgeries. So I'm presenting these kind of in contrast to the works that I will end the discussion with, which are indeed outright forgeries. Um, so again, we have to think of the time period that we're looking at, and we also have to think about the intent of the artist. Is there the intent to deceive and make somebody think it's by the master artist? So we're starting with um, a very famous example for any who likes to study classical art, you will find out um, pretty soon that uh, the Romans really loved Greek sculpture um, and they really liked to copy Greek sculpture, um, but it's not as simple as just Romans loving Greek sculpture and wanting to copy it. Um, in some cases, they are definitely pleasing clients. So we know that there were workshops all around the Roman Empire. We know that they took um, plaster casts, they made plaster casts from Greek sculptures so that they could replicate them and duplicate them to meet demand for, for clients throughout the Roman Empire. 
Um, but there's also something to be said for a lot of these sculptures that maybe emulate a Greek sculpture, but they're also something very uniquely Roman about them. So there are a lot of variants with them. There are a lot of um, kind of differences in the copies. So even though they're working from plaster casts, sometimes they're also putting a unique um, kind of interpretation of the sculpture. So here you're looking at the Doriferous. Um, so this is a very famous sculpture after the artist uh, Polyclitus. So the interesting about this work, thing about this work is that the original does not survive. So the only thing that we know about Polyclitus's work is um, written documents. We know that he wrote a whole treatise on it, um, much of which did not survive, but other subsequent scholars wrote about this work. And there's also at least 60 casts that were made or replicas that were made of this sculpture. And you're looking at, at one of them here um, that's in the Minneapolis Museum. And um, side note, Italy has sent a request to, to have the sculpture returned to their country. Um, so in this particular case, the original was actually bronze. And so we're looking at a marble copy of a bronze original. So already with this example, we're starting to see how it is straying from the original. And when we refer to it, we don't use the word forgery often to talk about it. We often say this is a Roman copy of a Greek original. Um, and really, we don't know what Polyclitus would have thought of this practice. Perhaps, perhaps he would have thought differently. Um, there are, I just, I get a kick out of this because there's often cases as well where some of these plaster casts get repurposed and used for an entirely new composition. So this is the head of the Doriferous um, from the cast, and it was attached to a 16th century marble bust. And so this creates a whole new composition. So is this any more the Doriferous? Is this still a work by Polyclitus? Can we look at this and refer to that original artist? I think it's kind of up for debate because now it's been attached to a completely different form. Um, so now we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at this painting that's in the UAMA collection, just to continue talking about this issue of replicas and copies, because oftentimes when we think of artwork, um, we think about it as there's an original artwork. And this painting is a great example of how there's actually, um, it's not so simple. <laughs> so again, we're looking at this painting, The Holy Family. Um, this is on display at our museum, so you can come and see it. And it's a studio uh, painting by the studio of Andrea del Sarto. It is based on an original. Um, so the original is currently in Rome. Um, and so we know that, that there was the original that the master artist painted, but we also know that there were high quality copies of this work painted in the studio. So these were copies because they were painted in the workshop. We know that the artist himself said, yes, I don't want this to be just one painting. I have a lot of clients who really like this composition and I can make money off of this. I run this workshop, so I'm gonna have my assistants make a number of copies so that we can meet the demand of my patrons. So just to give you an idea of this, the original one, which is at the Palazzo Barberini is there on the left. And then we know of at least three copies that were made by the artist's workshop. So they are of a high enough quality, um, that demonstrates that they were probably supervised by the artist and also had firsthand access to his cartoons. So a cartoon is um, a sketch that's to scale that an artist can use kind of repeatedly as a tracing, essentially, um, to create and replicate compositions. So you can see that um, these studio copies are scattered around in various museums. And then we start to get to the after part. <laughs> so we have a lot of artists who are now um, creating these after the time period of Andrea del Sarto. They're copying the composition. You can see there are uh, varying scales of quality, um, varying scales of you know, intimate connection with that original painting. Some of these might even be a copy of a copy. So because these would have been spread all around, perhaps an artist who's living in Milan maybe has not seen the original and is copying a copy that they saw in Florence. I'm just making up an example. Um, the artist himself also did variants. Um, so this might not look like the same painting at all, right? It's a different composition. Um, we have on the left, the Holy Family showing Mary, Christ, and Joseph. And on the right, we have Mary, Christ, 
um, Elizabeth and John the Baptist. However, there are some similarities here. So you can see this leg here looks a whole lot like that leg. Um, so that's what I mean by an artist workshop, being able to take these cartoons, these sketches, and apply them to different compositions. It's a very efficient way of an artist workshop functioning. And we know that artists continue to copy it, and they made their own variants of it. <laughs> so I showed you um, copies that seem to be trying to replicate the majority of the composition as best as they could, maybe some differences in the color palette. But we also have artists who here in the middle decided that they like the setup, but they want to take a step back and kind of broaden the view of, of these figures. And they also want to change the setting to an indoor setting. So that tree has now turned into a column. And then on the right hand side, we have another variant where it's essentially the same composition, but they've added in little John the Baptist there on the left. So again, when we think about originality and authenticity, like in that particular case with the Sarto, we can say, yes, this painting on the far left, that is the one by Andrea del Sarto, after which numerous copies were made. It's the studio workshop pieces, you know, the ones that were made in his studio with his permission. How are those not as original, you know, especially if they were there to please a client, they were sort of approved by the artist. Um, it, it gets into this really interesting gray area. Um, and I just just a quick example, you know, there were other artists out there who also made variants of their paintings in order to meet demand. So Caravaggio did it with a couple of his compositions. Um, we have the fortune teller here, and you can see that he changed it enough where these are two separate paintings, but generally speaking, it's the same composition, it's the same topic. Um, they're roughly wearing the exact same clothes. He's just made a couple tweaks here to make, you know, unique paintings. Um, here's a really interesting one, and I'm bringing this example in because um, this is a situation where I'm not entirely sure that it was the artist who wanted to make the variant. In this particular case, I don't know for sure. Um, I think it may have been a choice of the patron. And so again, this is one of those really interesting areas where how do we determine authorship if we're not 100% sure that the artists themselves had all of the creative control? So who then is the responsible one or the one who's allowed to give permission to make copies? Is it the artist or is it sometimes the patron? In this particular case, I think it might have been the patron. Um, so this is kind of an interesting story. The painting on the left, we've had in our collection for um, a few decades, and it came into the collection as an anonymous artist and an anonymous sitter. Um, some years ago, I was researching online and I ended up finding this painting there on the right and I said oh my gosh that looks just like our painting except the coat of arms is really different and so I was able to track it down to this collection in the United Kingdom and I reached out to them and I said look we have this painting that's almost identical do you know who the sitter is and they said oh yes it's Henrietta St. John and so your painting um so she was a a British woman who was a poet and a letter writer. Um, she had a very scandalous um, separation from her husband and, um, and our painting was painted either before or after her legal separation. So we know that because of the coat of arms. So that coat of arms there is of the St. John family. It's in a diamond shape because that was associated with females. And, um, and so she's sitting here with just a single coat of arms. On the right hand side, we now see that there are two coats of arms. So hers and that of her husband, Robert Knight. And we can see that they're unified under this crown, implying that there's a union and they're married. Um, so the issue with these two paintings is that they're almost the same. It's a variant for sure, because there are some differences, um, but I don't know if they're by the same artist or not. And so, and I think they're different enough where they may have been two different artists that perhaps Henrietta really loved this portrait. She wanted it to sort of be used as her official portrait, and she may have ended up working with a different artist to make the other one. So lots of still uh, fun questions that need to be answered about this particular painting, because I don't know which one came first, if it's ours or theirs. So stay tuned. Okay, so I feel like I've set the scene. Um, lots of gray areas about authenticity. And we're now gonna start talking about some of the forgeries and all. But before we get to that, I wanna explain um, 
this approach to art authentication, because I think it's really important to understand how we authenticate artwork in the first place. There are what I like to think of as three main lines of inquiry. So one is provenance. So the provenance is a word that relates to the history of a painting. So from the moment it left the artist's studio, where did it go? Who owned it? Where was it exhibited? And how do we know? So what's the evidence for that? And the evidence um, can be really difficult to track down. Um, you have to be a little bit creative with how you um, have evidence of provenance. And of course, the older the work of art is, sometimes the more difficult it is to track down that provenance. So some of the examples we could use for evidence of provenance would be a sales receipt. It could be an inventory list of someone's art collection. It could be a photograph of a painting hanging in someone's house. It could be a sticker on the back of the painting that says this was exhibited at this museum and this is the exhibition and the date. Um, it could be an inventory number inscribed on the back of the frame or a stamp, a seal on the back of the frame that implied it was owned by somebody. Um, so a lot of these things can be difficult to track down. In some ways, it's starting to get a little bit easier with um, the internet because a lot of galleries now have their archives published. So sometimes you can track down that sales receipt. Sometimes you can find correspondence between um, a buyer and an artist. It gets trickier if someone's buying directly from an artist or you know, if a painting has been in someone's family for generations, you know, there might be a long gap in, in provenance. Um, there's also another line of inquiry, which we refer to as connoisseurship. Um, so this is a difficult one to describe in some ways because it can be very subjective. It, at least it seems subjective, but I have to stress that when, when someone is an expert on an artist, it means that they have literally spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours studying that person's artwork. And although there's no way to really quantify how you get an eye for a particular artist, it is the sort of muscle memory that happens when you do this really close looking, when you spend a lot of time with an artist painting, you can start to understand this is what their brush strokes look like. This is the color palette that they worked with. This is how they depict an eye. This is how they depict a hand. This is how they do drapery. And it sounds like a very, again, subjective or sort of non-scientific way, um, but it's a very valid way to actually understand an artist. Um, and, and it is something that is trained and learned. And then there's, of course, the scientific side, the technical analysis. Um, so that could be something like doing an x-ray of the painting to see if there's an underdrawing underneath. It could be taking um, a paint sample and seeing, you know, is this paint available at the time that this painting was created? Or was this a, a later color that was invented later on? It could be taking a look at the paper, you know, was paper made this particular way at that time? So technical analysis can tell you a lot. What it can't always do is identify the specific artist um, because in, in some cases it's a bit more general. Like, yes, this paint was available at that time. Yes, this type of canvas was available at that time. Um, there are certain traits of an artist that can be identified through technical analysis, but not always. Um, so really, some of these go hand in hand. Sometimes you need all three to really make a decision. Sometimes you only need one. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. All right, so we do have five confirmed and most likely a sixth forgery in or fake, fake sand forgeries in the museum's collection. These were all acquired from the same art dealer who was semi-retired. Um, these were all acquired in the early 1970s and they were all purchased by um, a very dear donor to us, Edward Gallagher Jr. If you've been to our museum, you have seen his name. If you have heard about our stolen and recovered painting, you've definitely heard of him because Edward Gallagher over the course of 20 years donated about 200 works of art to our museum um, as he built a memorial collection to honor the memory of his son. So these were part of that memorial collection. Um, there was a financial settlement, which I'll, I'll explain all the details as, as much as I can piece them together. Um, and because of that, 
a lot of records redacted the name of this gallery dealer. And so my understanding is that there was a a legal something that because there was a financial settlement that the museum and university agreed not to publicize the name. And so because of that, I'm going to stick to that and not say the name so I don't get myself into trouble. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start with this work because this is the first one that was discovered. So on the left hand side, you're looking at a forgery of Kandinsky's Rua or Calm from 1928. On the right, you're looking at a not great image of the painting because the painting is in a private collection and I have not been able to get a really good photograph of it, despite my efforts. Um, so in 1975, it, this actually happened just quite on, on chance. Um, the UAMA curator at the time ended up seeing a print of this painting. So I'm assuming, and again, I have to piece a lot of this information together based on records that we have at the museum and based on my knowledge of, of past events and programs at the museum. So from my understanding, we had an outreach program. We would go to schools, we would bring reproductions of paintings and you know, meet with children and give lessons in the classroom. So one of these reproductions happened to be sitting out and the curator saw it and thought, huh, that's funny. It says this is in a private collection. And so he reached out to the New York Graphic Society, which was the fine art reproduction company that made that print and said, hey, I think you need to change your caption because this painting is now in our collection. And they said, well, we think it's in a private collection. <laughs> and so um, this started a bit of an investigation. So on the left-hand side, um, I've kind of parsed out the main details of the provenance. On the right-hand side, this is an actual letter um, that was given from that art dealer to Edward Gallagher talking about the provenance. So he's saying, I'm giving you a transparency of the Kandinsky. It's in Switzerland. It's available uh, for $30,000. Um, it was sold by the Guggenheim through Sotheby's in 1961, and it was purchased by Nathan Cummings, who in turn sold it to the present owners who now live in Lugano. So these Swiss owners are interested in selling it, is basically what he's saying. So I, again, I've kind of pieced it out there on the left-hand side. So it went from the Guggenheim to Sotheby's to Nathan Cummings. Nathan Cummings then sold it to this woman, Madame Musler, who owned this corporation in Liechtenstein or in Switzerland. Um, and then the gallery representing Madame Musler or the dealer is selling it to Edward Gallagher, who then donated it to us. So all of that sounds great. Fortunately, this was a lie. <laughs> so part of it was true. Um, it turns out that Nathan Cummings did own it and he still owned it. And so they were able to track this down. They contacted Nathan Cummings and said, this is our understanding that you bought it at this auction and that you sold it. And he said, the only thing I can tell you about Kandinsky's Calm 1928 is that it is part of my collection and has been since July of 1964. I trust this is the information you need. So that confirmed that we did not have the original painting. So this is an aside. This really has nothing to do with um, uh, the dealer, but I can't not let this go because the provenance was faked to our museum. Um, and this painting has a really fascinating and really important provenance. Um, so I just want to make sure you all know it. Um, so it has a really significant story. It was part of the National Gallery in Berlin, part of their permanent collection. It was confiscated by the Nazis, as many, many modern artworks were. It was exhibited in the Degenerate Art Exhibition in 1937. And when I talk about examples of provenance, um, I'm showing you some here. So here is um, on the left-hand side is an installation image from that exhibition. Right, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right above that white geometric Mondrian painting, you can see the bottom of Rua on display. Down below is also a copy of the layout of that exhibition, and you can see it displayed there as well. Um, so it was part of that exhibition. It was then sold by Gute Kunst and Klipstein Auction House and ended up at the Guggenheim. And then the rest of it is true. The Guggenheim did sell it through Sotheby's to Nathan Cummings. It just never left Nathan Cummings' possession. So the museum did start legal action. So they pursued, um, they contacted a lawyer, 
who went to the dealer and said, you know, this turned out to be fake. The dealer was like, wow, that's a surprise. I had no idea. And so he ended up giving a sum of money to kind of settle the deal. So all of that would have been fine, except that's not where the story ends. And so a couple of years later, another forgery was discovered in really the exact same way. <laughs> so um, the staff was in a meeting. And again, there was another reproduction of this painting. And at the time, the director, who was Peter Birmingham, some of you might remember him or have known him, um, he said, he thought to himself, that is not what our painting looks like. And so he went into the vault and looked at the painting. And sure enough, he realized this is not an authentic painting. Um, so they ended up contacting the museum, the Boyman's Museum in Rotterdam who confirmed it was part of their collection. So right now I'm showing you, obviously they didn't have this kind of access in 1979. They couldn't just pull up a museum website and do a search and find a painting. You know, they had to write letters, they had to look at books, um, but I am just showing you that, you know, this is what the original painting looks like and it's still in their collection. Um, so the Mark painting, I'm gonna show you some details just to compare the two. So on the left, is the forgery and on the right is the authentic one. So I want to stress it because I, I, what I don't want is people to think, my gosh, how could the museum curators not have known? It's so obvious when you look at the two paintings side by side. It is obvious when you look at them side by side. It's not obvious if you're only working with one painting. Um, so I just wanna stress that, that yes, when we see these two, we can see the one on the left is the forgery. Um, it's very clumsy. It doesn't have those really beautiful transitions from light to dark. If I were a Franz Marc expert, I probably could have identified that immediately and say, yes, that is not the color palette he uses. These are what his brush strokes look like. But again, in isolation, it's a bit trickier. Um, here's another detail. So again, the forgery on the left, um, the original one on the right. And again, you can see the, there's just no attention to that. Um, the attempt at three-dimensionality with those transitions from light to dark, particularly in the green areas. But the part that I find funny now, I mean, it's not funny, but it is funny, is I always thought, my gosh, our forger was so bad and so lazy that they didn't even bother to include the full M for the signature. So on the left, that's the forged version. And that's literally the edge of the painting that I'm showing you. And you can see it's just the first part of the M and then it's cut off. But in the original version, the full M is there. And I would think to myself, why would our forger do that? Because of all the things to forge, you would want the signature in there in its entirety because that's, that's one of the ways you can dupe a person. So then I start scouting eBay because I decide I want to get a poster. I want, I want to find that reproduction poster. And I do, I find it on eBay. And, um, and so I bought it and we now have the reproduction poster. Um, this is the, you know, the same example of the one that the UAMA staff in 1979 saw. And look in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that the M has been cut off in the exact same way which tells us that our forger was obviously not looking at the original, they were copying a copy. And so it gets weirder. Um, the original dimensions of the painting are 21 and a half by 30 inches. Ours is 16 and a half by 23. I'm sure you can guess what the dimensions of the reproduction are. They are 16 and a half by 23. So again, all of this is evidence. We don't need to take a paint sample. We know that it belongs to this museum in Rotterdam, we know our dimensions correspond to a common reproduction. They don't correspond to the original object itself. So it absolutely is a forgery. Um, here is another example. So once they found the Franz Marc forgery, they thought, well, I guess we really need to start looking at every single thing that Gallagher bought from that dealer because it's really not looking good. <laughs> um, so they discovered this, this Feiniger, um, they worked with an art history professor um, at the U of A. His name was Sheldon Reich, and he helped them do a lot of the research. He ended up determining that this painting was located in the Folkwang Museum in Essen, Germany, where it remains to this day. So again, we can now do an easy Google search and discover its location. It was not that way, not that easy um, back when they were doing this research. 
So again, just comparing the two side by side. Now this particular one, um, we have a newspaper article where Peter Birmingham was saying that he was never sure about this painting and he, he never wanted it on view because he thought it was just a really terrible example of a Feininger work. Turns out his instincts were correct because it wasn't a real one at all. And Sheldon Reich proposed that probably the artist was not working, well, for sure they weren't working with the original because again, the original dimensions are 39 and a half by 31 and a half. Ours is only 20 and a half by 16 and a half. So not the right dimensions. Um, Sheldon uh, thought that perhaps the, the forger was actually working with this book. So there was a monograph that was in circulation at the time, would have been really easily attainable at any library and, um, and the forger could have been using this as the example. So again, the, the three paintings I showed you were so obvious with the provenance, with the, the style that there was no need to affirm it through technical examination. That would have been kind of a waste of money because there was just no need to even go there. So um, here's another letter. So the, these also were associated with um, this Madame Musler. Um, so this is a letter um, from Madame Musler to the art dealer. And she says, in reply to your telephone conversation, please let me state that I agree to accept two payments for the Franz Mark and Lionel Feiniger for a total of $50,000, $27,500 and $22,500 respectively. The first payment to be made this year and balance in 1975. Um, and then she goes on to say, as you know, there's still a balance due at the Glendalough Trading Corporation, which is also payable this year. So we have this conversation, this letter from, um, you know, Madam Musler, and then this mention of this Glendalough Trading Corporation. I will come back to those in just a second. But first, we have more forgeries. So um, here was another one that was say, sold by the same dealer. Um, this one, they did end up using technical examination. I don't think they really needed to just based on um, photos. I mean, you'll, you'll see for yourself that this is very clearly a forgery. Um, I think it's great that they ended up getting a technical examination. It certainly does tell us a lot about the differences, which are interesting to read about. So on the left, that's the forgery that's in our collection. Um, it's a painful image because the sweet girl is really excited to be posing um, as a ballerina with a Degas, but it's not an actual Degas, but it was exhibited in the museum as a Degas. On the right, I was able to go to the Norton Simon Museum where they have an actual Spanish dance there. And so I was able to get some pictures of, of the authentic one. So stylistically, again, if someone was a Degas expert, they could probably look at our sculpture and would have outright said that is not a Degas. Um, they would have known his forms. They would have known the texture of the clay that he used to make the sculptures. They would have known, um, his signature and what the signature should be. So little details that, again, that's where the connoisseurship becomes really important. Um, but a curator can't be a connoisseur on every single artist. And it's just impossible. Um, so again, I think you can see with the forms that, you know, ours is just really lacking the elegance of the Degas. Um, it, it just doesn't have have it, <laughs> the elegance. Um, there's So there's a lot to work off of. So not only are there an addition of 22 of the Spanish dancers that were cast, that were approved by his state. They were um, all cast posthumously after the artist died. Um, but there's also his original wax um, model that is at the National Gallery. So it was sent to the Fogg Museum at Harvard um, for a technical study. And so the technical study is pretty interesting. I'm not gonna read through all of it because it's a lot, but I'm gonna kind of, highlight the details. So they compared our bronze with the Norton Simon collection, which was considered to be, you know, an original, no questions about the authenticity of that one. So it made for a good comparison. Um, the observations they made were that our cast um, weighed more. It was taller, but that the base was of a different size. Um, ours is of a different patina. So the color of the sculpture on ours is more black. It should have been more of a dark green. Um, the investment, which is sort of the residue left behind inside of the sculpture through the, the casting process, ours was a different color. So ours was reddish, it really should have been white. And then the signature was different. Um, it lacked the founder stamp from where the bronze was poured. So essentially what this is telling us is that everything is wrong with our sculpture. 
Um, so I'm just showing you on the left um, a detail of the forgery. And you can see the signature there. And then on the right, it's hard to make out his signature. It's over here at the far right, sort of in the center of it. And you can see it's just a very, very different signature. And again, anyone who was an expert on Degas probably would have identified that immediately. It's hard to see, but you can also see um, probably the founder stamp, which is there at the top of the authentic version on the right. All right, so what happened next? Now that all these forgeries have been discovered, well, there's a lot of news about it. And that's partly because um, Peter Birmingham felt really strongly that he did not want to stay quiet about this. Um, now, he, he was in a really tricky spot because on the one hand, they're trying to hold this dealer accountable because maybe one forgery could have slipped slipped through the cracks and maybe he wouldn't have known. And he was also a victim of this, but we're now, the list of forgeries is growing. And so um, this now is becoming apparent that it was obvious. It also becomes more obvious because the U of A hires an attorney in Zurich to seek out who is Madame Musler, who is, what is this Glendalau Corporation? Well, it turns out there was no one by the name of Hildegard Musler living anywhere in Zurich, Lugano or Liechtenstein. Um, the Glendalau Corporation existed, but it was a shell company. And guess who the owner was? The gallery dealer or the art dealer. Um, so he had this shell company where he was funneling this money. We don't know who wrote the letter um, for, and signed Madame Musler. He must have had somebody he knew um, kind of fake that letter. But this was this was a scam. And the gallery owner played dumb when he was told that he was, in fact, the owner of the company. Um, so they did settle for a little more money, um, nowhere near to the $250,000 that you see, which is what the estimated value of what those works would have actually been. Um, there was really nothing the museum could do. And that's because in, in the eyes of the legal team, the museum wasn't the victim. It was really Edward Gallagher Jr. So he was the person who spent the money. He was the one who bought them, but he donated them to the museum. So we really didn't have a legal leg to stand on. Um, the settlement, like I said, was probably enough to kind of give the museum and the university enough money to just kind of drop it and not spread this around town. Um, although I know from correspondence, Peter Birmingham was not happy with the settlement at all. Um, so what he did was he said, well, we're gonna tell the story. We're gonna display the artwork. And so they did an art exhibition called, um, I think it was called Seeing is Believing. And he put the fakes on view. He got reproductions of the works that they were based on. And he told the story and basically said, you know, this is a real world issue with museums. And I want all of you to know about this. This is a public collection held in the public trust. And we need to be forthright about this. And we've really followed that philosophy. We talk, obviously, we talk really openly <laughs> about the forgeries. Um, and I wish I could say that the story ends there, but there's uh, there's a couple more hanging threads that I just want to talk about really quickly. There, um, even after he did the exhibition, there were a couple of artworks from that same dealer that were marked as suspicious. So they they weren't yet able, when that exhibition happened, to say yes for sure these are fakes or forgeries, but they were suspicious enough where they were kept off public view. So this is one of them. I don't know what to call it because it's not a forgery, because I don't know of an existing composition that it's copying. Um, so maybe it's a fake, but it's also not a good fake. And I'll explain why. So supposedly this is a painting called French Farm that is by the artist Lucien Pizarro. You might know his brother, Camille Pizarro, the much more famous one. Um, so this one is so weird because there was a scholar doing a catalog resume on Lucien Pizarro. And this happens often where um, an artist foundation or scholars are working on a catalog resume. They send out an open call to museums saying, we are compiling the catalog resume. Let us know if you have this artist's work in your collection. And then they determine whether or not it should be included. So the catalog resume, you can think of as a book that comprises the entirety of an artist's life's, life's work. Um, if you have a work that's not included in the catalog resume, that's really bad because that, that tells the world that the scholars who compiled that catalog resume do not believe that that work is actually by the artist. And that's the case with this. Um, so the museum got the call, they reached out and said, we have this painting, I'll send you a photograph. 
and the scholar responds. So there in, um, in the letter there on the left, she said, it is of course impossible to tell from a photograph, but I am not at all sure about this painting. It looks to me much more like Paul Emile Pizarro, Lucien's youngest brother, or even Mansana, George Pizarro, the rather unreliable brother. So she says, um, could you please take the painting out of the frame, send me a detail of the signature. And she goes on to explain that he never signed in full after 1895. Stylistically, and from what I can see of the brushwork, I cannot relate this painting at the moment to his oeuvre at all. So we send off the photograph and then her response is there on the right. I can only say that for me, this is definitely not Lucy and Pizarro's signature. I really am sorry. Um, this does not look to me like one of his very early paintings. And again, he only used his monograph later on. Um, and then she goes on to the icing on the cake. The only other comment I can make is that the painting is not a size previously recorded as ever used by Lucy and Pizarro. And it is not a size of a canvas sold in France. So needless to say, it was not included in the catalog resume. But at the same time, she didn't recognize the composition. So I don't say it's a forgery. I would say it's probably an attempt at a really bad fake. Or perhaps it's by a totally different artist. And someone looked at it and said, I'm going to slap a Lucien Pizarro signature on top of it and call it a day. So we don't fully know. Oh, oh on the left is an actual uh, Lucien Pizarro. You can see that monograph there on the lower left. So you can see what she was referring to in terms of the signature. So just a couple more, and I'm going to close it out. Um, this is one of the more recent discoveries. So this had been marked as suspicious for a very long time, because again, it was bought through that same dealer. It was not until 2013, um, our curator at the time, Lauren Rabb, got in touch with the Lembrook Museum and was able to finally close this case. And sadly, it did not turn out how we wanted to. They verified that it is not a Lembrook. Um, so here it is on the left. And then again, I'm just trying to show you that these, these objects were accepted and displayed as authentic art objects. And you can see it there. It's a little guy, you know, on display in the gallery. And that was part of the problem is that it's small and uh, really it should be life size. It's about 70 inches tall and um, it's not of bronze, it's made of cast stone. Now, this wouldn't immediately be a concern because sculptors oftentimes make small little maquettes as they're practicing and kind of building their ideas for larger compositions. Um, but the Lembrook Museum said they have no record of him ever making a small bronze of this composition. Um, so again, I don't even know what to call it because it's not a forgery because it's nowhere even near to being the size of the original. Um, so I guess it's a fake. It's kind of kind of a weird area for that one. And then lastly, um, this is the hanging question here, the Henry Moore there on the left. So this one has not been on view in decades because it is suspicious. Um, we have tried to get confirmation from the Henry Moore Foundation. Um, unfortunately, they're, they're not willing to authenticate it without seeing it in person, which I understand where they're coming from. They're doing their due diligence. Um, the problem is that it's just not looking great. And so it's hard to want to spend that kind of money to ship it into England um, in order to get what's probably going to be bad news. So um, if business, um, other business ever brings us out to England, this is something that we would bring with us and, and try to tie up that end. Um, but it is thought to have been one of his maquettes. He did make a lot of maquettes for the sculpture you see here. And I'll just show you some of them that are considered to be authentic Henry Moores. So in conclusion, um, unlike our other art crime story, the one of woman ochre that was stolen in 1985 and recovered in 2017 and just came back to us in 2022, um, this is a story that really does not have a happy ending. Um, our donor was duped. Our museum had no real recourse because the works were donated. Um, and the gallery dealer still made a profit, even after the financial settlement with the museum. Um, so is there a silver lining? <laughs> I don't, I, I think there is, um, because these works are still at the museum. So we did deaccession them. They are now considered part of our study collection. Part of the reason we keep onto them is that they never go back into circulation so that no one else ever gets tricked by them. But the other reason we keep them is that we use them a lot. So every single year, 
we get classes in art history and criminal justice and even a class in forensic accounting that come in and learn from these works. They learn about authentication and provenance research. They learn about these real struggles that museums continue to face. And so in that sense, although they are not authentic, I do still think that they fulfill that original intent that Gallagher had, you know, and his intent was to honor his son's memory by creating this incredible resource for students and faculty on our campus. And we continue to use them in that way. So I'm going to end on that positive note. And thank you all so much. I am happy to, to take questions. So I'm going to look at the chat because I, I think there have been some questions in there. I just haven't had time to look at it. So just give me a second to just go through. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so Jan asked, in the case of a studio work, would the patron or client have realized that it was not done by the master? Um, I can't say with 100% certainty that every single work would have been that way. I can say I am assuming yes. Um, and I say that partly because there are certain artist contracts that survive. And there are certain situations where the patron specifically says, no other hand can touch this painting except for the master artist himself. So a lot of patrons knew that when they were approaching an artist with a large studio that they might have to pay, that they would have to pay extra money in order to have the master artist do the work entirely um, themselves without the help of assistance. And, and other people probably were perfectly fine paying a little less, but having an almost comparable work. And, and as they could still say it's from that artist studio. So I think I think most people would have known what they were buying. Um, let's see, let's see, lots of suggestions. This is great, thank you all. Oh, that's a great question from David Van Ocker. And you might recognize that name because he's one of our favorite people who found the de Kooning and returned it. Um, so he has two drawings that were purchased through a reputable gallery in the 1950s. Later, it was discovered that the gallery sold forgeries of this artist along with originals. If I find out that mine are forgeries, should they be destroyed? Um, that's, that's a really good question. It really does pertain to um, what what we deal with at the museum with these forgeries. If we were to make the decision to not keep them in the study collection, we would, I think, be ethically obligated to destroy them so that they didn't risk falling back into the art market. Um, because you are a private owner, I can't necessarily say that that same ethics policy would apply. Um, the only thing I would recommend is that somehow they are clearly marked as forgeries so that in the event they fall back into circulation, that there's no risk of them being, being, you know, tricking a new buyer. I don't know exactly how you would mark that, but, um, but that would be my thought. Um, thank you all. These are all such great questions. All right. I think that's, I think those are all the questions. Um, is there anything else? I'll give you just uh, I have one question for you, oh, yes. Olivia. You can ask a question, Chelsea. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm just curious if we know of any other collectors or galleries that um, maybe were potentially um, duped, I guess, by this gallery uh, or the dealer. I I don't know. And it's one thing that actually Violet, who's been in the chat, she and I, um, she just reached out. And, and try to get the records of this gallery um, to see if we could track down more information about ours. Um, unfortunately, those records have not been digitized. And so they're really not accessible right now. And so um, although I have done, every now and again, I'll do a Google search for Glendalough Corporation just to see now that more museums are starting to publish their collections online. Um, if I were to find that in someone's, in a museum's provenance, I would absolutely reach out. but. But other than that, I'm not exactly, I don't know. I have to imagine that if we got the, this many forgeries, he must have had a lot more that he was selling. Um, and the tricky thing is that he um, he was a certified appraiser. So Gallagher was not, you know, I say he was duped and that's probably not being super fair because he knew how to buy art. He bought a, a lot of great art. 
Um, the issue with this is that he knew this dealer personally, and this dealer had all the credentials. There was no need to question him. He was um, part of the American Society of Appraisers. He had had a gallery for a long time. Um, there was really no, you know, this wasn't just some random guy. <laughs> so it's tricky. Yeah. Yeah. I, when I use that word, I was like, that's not the word I want. So I appreciate you sharing that and uh, all the documentation that you shared in the presentation, I think really, um, yeah, goes to show that this was not a, um, a, a cheap operation. It was a very um, well thought out uh, operation for sure. Yeah. A cautionary tale for all of us. Indeed. Thank you so much, Olivia. Thank you all to have uh, that have joined us. Um, I know it's six o'clock, so I want to be mindful of your time, Olivia. If there's any other questions that you wanted to to answer, we'll end here. All right. Um, yeah, just last one. Who are the artists who make these forgeries, and are they ever caught and prosecuted? The answer is sometimes yes. We have no idea who our forgers were. Um, so. So unfortunately, we don't know about those, but it does happen from time to time. Again, it all depends on who is the person who is deceived and who who is the one who ends up bringing bringing charges, I guess, against against that artist. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate you being here and spending time with me this evening. And hopefully, I will see you all at the museum or online again soon. Thank you.